number of missions in Ukraine in 2014 for both elections in May and October. The OEC mission that you are referring to was there, and Canada contributed, um, I forgot, but around 60 observers, and the, so others understand the OEC mission consists of all the members, groups, different countries contribute a number of observers that they can afford. So I think Canada contributed 60 and every country contributed a number of observers. And then they had the mission, like you said, you know, it was a, a clear goal. We were part of the mission put together by the government of Canada. It was a Canadian election observation mission. That was the name of the mission. It was uh, fully funded um, by the government of Canada but they outsourced it to an NGO that did the recruitment, uh, set the strategic goals, uh, sent the mission, did all the uh, bookings for us. So we were, uh, the, the group was, um, both missions were led by a senator from Canada, Raynal Andrejczak from Saskatchewan. Uh, so uh, it was a Canadian mission. We, we were an arm's length mission. We were an independent mission, but uh, since we were funded by the government of Canada, we prepared a report which is available online um, f called Canadian Election Observation Mission in Ukraine. So it's an independent mission. Our goals, if you ask me what our goals were, similar to other missions, there were a couple missions from the U.S. Uh, OEC mission than our mission. Very similar. You observe the electoral process. You don't intervene. They warned everybody. If you see violation, uh, if something is happening, if somebody is trying to, you know, <laughs> put extra ballots in the ballot box, you don't uh, yell or tell them to stop. All you do, you observe, you record, you send, they have a very sophisticated system of reporting. You report back to the headquarters, and um, I was in October in the headquarters as director of communications, and we were analyzing information coming from all across the country. And then in our final report, we, we, we had a way of determining if it was an isolated incident or it was spread wide. Uh, and that's how you determine if the election was democratic or not. You look at the trends, and then the, there are different ways you can determine if the election was democratic. So we prepared the report. It's available online in three languages, English, uh, French, and Ukrainian. And uh, we, we did a press conference, and then we reported back um, to the Department of uh, Foreign Affairs uh, at that time that the mission was completed, and here is our report. All the information is available publicly uh, for Ukraine. We weren't given anything specific to observe. We had um, briefings before we were uh, dispatched to different areas with basic understanding of Ukrainian electoral law, which is very different actually from Canadian law. So we, we knew a little bit uh, about the law. And then we also uh, listened to observers um, and, and the core team from the previous elections, what to watch for, what are the common trends or common ways that, that the election is usually, um, you know, what are the common problems? And uh, we weren't really told to watch for anything specific, just, you know, here's what the law states, here are the common, you know, problems that happen in that country. Uh, but uh, the questions were pretty, you know, broad, and uh, we were observing, you know, on size of the station, like from basic questions about how large or small the polling station is, to, you know, uh, if, if there were more than one person in the voting booth, for example, or, you know, so some basic questions that uh, we here understand as, uh, you know, for, for a democratic process to take place that they should happen or shouldn't happen. So, yeah, we, 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 we had a lot of freedom in terms of, you know, where to go, that they would assign us to a specific electoral district, but within the district there were, you know, uh, dozens of polling stations. So we, we were free to figure out our own map and go and arrive unexpectedly at any polling station. 
And uh, if we knew the, the, the Canadian mission, I don't know about other missions, they send people in advance of short-term observers that only come for two weeks. There were long-term observers that came for a couple of months. So they already met, uh, visited different stations and determined where, you know, some problem might happen, like, you know, uh, restricted access to the commission for ex local committee or... Uh, so we, we had some tips from our um, long-term observers, but we, we had full freedom to observe uh, whatever we wanted you know, within the law of Ukraine. Uh, a couple points, I guess, on Ukraine and NATO enlargement. I wouldn't throw NATO enlargement as a part of the you know, a requirement for democratic transformation and the EU enlargement and all the other democratic reforms that are taking place in Ukraine. I would look at it strictly as a mechanism to defend countries' borders. In Ukraine's case, if Ukraine, like, the support for NATO in Ukraine was very low for 20 years until Russia annexed the part of Ukraine and started the war in another part of Ukraine. After that, support for NATO enlargement has actually gone up. Why? Because Ukrainians strictly look at it, if, if we were part of NATO, Russia with its military power would not be doing what they're doing right now to Ukraine. And uh, right now countries like the Baltic states, for example, you know, I'm sure they're happy that they're part of NATO because uh, the, the risk of Russia invading right now uh, Lithuania or Latvia is much lower. And I know countries in northern Europe that are not a part of NATO are considering that. I, I would look at it strictly as a, as a way to, for Eastern European maybe countries, including particular Ukraine, is to protect its borders. What's happening right now with one and a half million people displaced, over 10,000 people killed, more people injured, and nobody can do anything to Russia, it's, it's, a, it's a disgrace.